Students, as you know, the semester has begun and we have been interacting for different aspects of the course on nanostructure materials, characterization and properties of nanostructure materials. And you know, we are going to discuss in this lecture more about the different processes or different techniques rather to prepare nanostructure materials. But in the last lecture, thankfully, <laughs> We have completed all our discussions on phase diagram. That was indeed a lot of mathematical expression. And uh, it was not easy to understand those things. So you must read carefully. And then at the end, I started discussing about synthesis routes of nanomaterials. Right. So you know that phase diagrams are significantly affected by the size or by the shape, size, as well as the curvature of nanoparticles. And we have discussed many facets of that, like we have discussed about the chemical composition change, we have discussed about the melting temperature depression, and we have also discussed the phase boundaries, how they are going to be changed and how we can actually calculate that. And finally, we have also discussed different routes of, of synthesis, right? And we will continue discussing on that today. So, as you know, in the bulk nanostructure materials, you have grains and the gain boundaries, right? So, grains and gain boundaries are going to be different entities. We need to use as a different entities in case of nanomaterials. Why? Because gain boundary area is pretty large and they form a significant part of the surface energy or interfacial energy of the system. Hence, we have to consider gain boundary as a separate phase. That is what we have done at the end of the last lecture. I derived or I rather described an equations which will can be used to calculate the phi energy of the whole system consisting of grains and gain boundaries by West Mullah and others who came. Now, uh, as you know, these things when you consider the energetics aspects of that phase boundaries significantly altered okay, because of these size effect. As you can see for all the silver copper phase diagrams, I have been showing in again and again, the eutectic temperature has shifted down, composition also has shifted to the left side and in fact all the phase boundaries have shifted as compared to the bulk one. Bulk one is shown by dotted blue curve. Okay. So that is what it is. Not only that, if you consider the gain and gain boundaries and then if you develop a con comprehensive thermodynamical equation relating the phi energy of gain boundaries and the grains separately, looking into all aspects like surface energy or interfacial energy and also the entropic contributions, then you can plot that equation and get phi energy of mixing as a function of gain size as well as gain boundary concentration. Okay. Gain boundary concentration is also uh, going to be changed. It will not be same as the concentration of the grains. right? Then you can find out the minima of these three dimensional plot to get an idea of what will be that equilibrium at a definite temperature and pressure for the system. And it is possible to do that. Okay. Well, then we also discussed about how phase transformation temperature can be changed or will be changed because of that. And finally, we derive an expression delta T, T R times the change is basically equal to alpha, gamma, T bulk transition temperature divided by delta H transition that is heat of transition and the particle size diameter particle into 1 minus beta, where beta was a factor which is given by 1 minus gamma old by gamma new multiplied by rho new by rho old to refer two thirds. Okay. And if this ratio is 
very close to, you know, very, very small, or you can ignore as compared to 1, then you can easily say beta is equal to 0, and then you can calculate the transformation temperature. The, what does this equation do? This equation allows you to calculate the change of transformation temperature, like melting temperature, change of any eutectic transformation temperature. You can actually calculate straight forward by using this equation, if you know the values very well. Okay. Well, as you know, delta H tans is available, you, you know from the literature. The bulk transit temperature also known, correct. Only thing which you don't know is the gamma values. Okay, density values may be known, but gamma values will not be known. And that's why the problem comes. That's why the calculating beta is difficult. And in many cases it is even impossible because surface energies are not available for many systems. In that case, you can simply ignore it and calculate using, using beta equal to zero. That's okay. These are all we discussed for the you know last uh, uh, couple of lectures. Okay, so uh, I'm not uh, going to discuss much about that, except uh, saying that you know the this thermodynamic descriptions are very extensive. You need to study well from the books and the papers which I'll provide you as a repository and then you can read it through and you can ask me questions how it is done. Well, then this has been used, this equation to plot a change of metallic temperature as a function of size for, or one by diameter for aluminum, pure aluminum. You can see that most of the experimental points are actually following the theoretical curve which is given by this. Okay. And it is very, very important that this theory works very well for the experimental values which we have people have obtained in various research. Okay, then finally we come to the synthesis of nanomaterials. As I said, there are two ways of synthesizing nanomaterials. One is called top down approach. That is why you can take a big size material, millimeter size or micron size, grain size material, and then break it down into pieces and pieces and pieces. Finally you arrive at the nano size. This is simply like you take a chalk, break it into small and small pieces, then get a dust of the chalk, still grinding it again and again to get a nanoparticles of the calcium carbonate. Okay, that's the ingredient, major ingredient in the chalk, right? Same thing is can be done here. There are many routes of, of many kinds of processes available for this kind. This is out, okay? But second one is which is routinely done by the chemical synthesis technique is to use a bottom-up approach. Bottom approach means you start in the molecule or start with atoms, then allow these atoms and molecules to come from micromolecules, and finally they can self assemble and form a nanostructured material. Okay? That is possible actually. But you know, in this process, you may not get a bulk nanostructured material, you will get a powder, a nanomaterial in the form of powder. So that can be again sintered to obtain a bulk nanostructured material. So we are going to discuss about those aspects later. So now there is also intermediate way, right? You can always use micro machining and also mechanical alloying to mix particles of a mix different kinds of elements together and form nanomaterials. Okay, again that will come as in the form of surface layers getting nanocrystallized or powders getting nanocrystallized. That those things need to be sintered to obtain a bulk nanomaterials. But in a very routine way, top down and bottom of the main approaches, main two approaches to produce nanomaterials. This you must not forget, this you must keep in mind when you are understanding the different synthesis routes of preparation of nanomaterials. Okay. And these things I am not going to discuss again, there are various ways of preparing 0D, 1D, 2D, we are going to discuss one by one that and also 3D nanomaterials or bulk nanomaterials. Correct. So you know, top-down approach. I just discussed. You take a bulk material, big grain size, break it down, and the ball milling is one such. A mechanical milling is one such technique which we discuss. Mechanical milling. All the chemical synthesis row or routes actually falls under bottom-up approach. Okay, all of them. Well, so we are going to discuss. Uh, you know, like we can divide our discussion based like how to produce zero dimension nanomaterials 
then one and two, and finally three. Let us first talk about how to produce zero dimensional geometry. Zero dimension, you know, right? In which all the directions x, y, z, the size of the nanomaterial, so there's a grain size, a particle size, all three directions is must be less than 100 nanometers. That means all the sizes in all the directions will be a nanometric domain. That's what is defined as a 1 to 100 nanometer. This is the uh, you know, important aspect of zero dimension nanomaterials. So, how do you make that? And I discussed one of them, the inert gas concentration. I'm not going to go back to again. This is the route which was used by uh, Hubert Gleiter in his, uh, you know, starting career in 1960s and 1970s. Okay. The next technique which is important is for you it is sonochemical. What is this technique? Well, sonochemical means using ultrasonic. What is that? What is known as? It is known as use of ultrasonic waves. Actually, you know, ultrasonic waves span in the frequency range of what? From 15 kilowatts to 1 gigahertz. Okay, these are called ultrasonic waves. They range 15 to kilo, 15 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. Right. That's what it is. That's it's a very large span. Okay. Now. You can produce this ultrasonic waves by using magnetostriction. What is magnetostriction? Okay, there are a lot of materials in which if you apply magnetic field, their length increases. So by increasing length, they, they, they can be used to produce a force. Okay, or basically you can produce to make an ultrasonic waves, right? Or you can do it by using piezoelectric transducers. Okay, that's also possible. So basically, it's like a horn. Okay, you can see there. This is a horn. This is what is called a as a horn, ultrasonic horn. It is moving uh, ups and uh, back and forth. That is how it is creating ultrasonic waves, right. So, the wavelength of the ultrasonic waves are very large. Okay. What are the wavelengths? Wavelengths will be from 1 to 10,000 microns. So, you must be wondering why well, if it is a micron, then, uh, then how can ultrasonic waves used for preparation nanomaterials? Well, that is what the crux of the matter is. Ultrasonic waves wavelengths does not make any effect as far as the size of nanoparticle is concerned. Well, so these are not molecular dimensions. Uh, so, therefore, there is no direct coupling of acoustic field. The ultrasonic is acoustic field with the chemical pieces. So, reaction actually happens because of a cavitation phenomena. What is cavitation phenomena? Well, you know, let us discuss about it. As this horn is moving ups and down, okay, it is creating tensile and compressive forces, right? Basically, it's the waves. As the waves moves, it creates a tensile and compression, right? You can see that actually. This is the wave, sound wave, which is shown here. This one, correct. So the top side is under tension, and bottom side is under compression. Okay, you can easily read of any sound waves uh, books or any sound. You will find out that when the sound wave moves. There is a compressive component, there is another, there is a tensile component. Now, the tensile part of the wave is an intense wave, wave 1, it will pull the liquid apart. As it pulls the liquid apart, this will create a cavity, right. The compressive part of the wave, what will happen? This will compress it. But before it compresses that cavity, it is a cavity forms, it is tensile force is going to create a cavity, right. It's just like a small cavity in the water. So now this again, then the compressive force comes. The compressive direction, the compressive part of the wave. This will try to close it up. But before it close it up, some uh, reactants will vaporize inside this bubble. Okay, that's what will happen. This is a bubble, or a basically tiny cavity. The next tensile wave then re-expand the bubble, and this oscillation happens. Expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction happens, correct. So, when because of these bubble size will change, as the bubble size changes, the bubble size will reach a critical size, and after which it will basically undergo a collapse, or so what we call as a bubble burst, correct. So, when it reaches a critical size, this bubble will undergo a collapse, and because of this collapse, uh, basically collapse is very rapid, it happens in a very, very small time scale. Okay, nanometric time scale like that. People have done bubble dynamics. They found that these bubbles collapse at in the nanosecond regime. And because of that, the heat transfer 
is adiabatic. What is that meaning by adiabatic? That is from the bubble to the surrounding water heat transfer will be adiabatic. There will be no heat transfer at all because of the fast collapse of the bubble in the nanosecond regime. And this can lead to huge increase of temperature. And you won't believe in these bubbles, that is what the reaction centers of these thermochemical synthesis, temperature can reach 5000 Kelvin. Yes, 5000 Kelvin, almost close to temperature of the sun. But because it is a big mass of solution, you do not feel it. It is happening in a tiny small bubble and this is happening in an adiabatic manner. Okay. You may ask if thousands of bubbles happen, then what will happen? Yes, then it will lead to explosion. But normally we do not allow that things to happen. Okay, and pressure inside will be also pretty high. Pressure can be as high as 2000 atmospheric pressure. So, such a high pressure and temperature, okay, it will react or it will trigger chemical reactions in this side these bubbles for the pieces or for the chemical things which you have already put in. Okay. Now, the size of this chemical, size of this pot will determine the size of the nanoparticle. So, that means size is very important, size of the bubble, very important, critical size of the bubble. And this can be altered by using different frequencies of the this horn or ultrasonic horn actually, you can do that. So, by using different frequency you can easily create that. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, by using organomechanical piece of pickers, uh, ceramics, metallic particles, anything can be prepared and it has been found as small as 2 nanometer size particles can be also produced. And most importantly, you can use this for large scale production of nanomaterials, means large volume of nanomaterials can be produced. You understand that? At the bottom, the cavity diameter function of time is shown. You know, I think initially the cavity will be small because of a tensile and compression compressive part of the wave pulling up and pulling pushing down and that is why the cavity will not grow much. But after some time because of this reversible process the cavity will start growing little bit and then finally it will reach a critical size and it will collapse. Any cavity any bubble actually once it is a critical size it collapses it bursts actually you have, see, you have seen yourself you can create those kind of bubbles by using you know various uh, ways like these two children play with bubble creators okay device you can also see these bubbles actually fly in the air then after going somewhere the size increases and it undergoes a collapse same thing happens here these liquid bubbles will collapse and collapse means temperature and pressure increase that's what can lead to very high uh, what's called temperature and pressure and reaction okay that's about the alsono chemical this is also used to produce zero dimension nanometers because nanoparticles are very small size. And the standard rule of preparation nanometer is a salt gel technique. And the way it says there is a salt and there is a gel, right? Gel all of you know because many of you use, uh, you know, whenever in the morning you are hurry and you are know, making a breakfast and you can use bread and then you can apply various kinds of jelly like mango jelly uh, or you know, uh, this. Uh, different fruits are available, jellies are available in the market. Okay, We call them jam actually, fruit jam, but they are nothing but a jellified things. If you look at it, they are very high viscous jellified thing. You have to really you know, apply it properly on the surface of the bread and to make it nice and tasty, right? And, but they are jelly actually. So, gels actually, but gel, you know gels can be prepared by many ways. That is different story, but you require a salt first to make that. So, ultra fine nanomaterials in this way even nano thickness films that is very thin films or nanoporous materials can be prepared by this way. The starting point is a solution picasa okay? and most of the cases picasa are basically organomechanic compounds like alkoxides. What is alkoxides? Okay, let me give an example like for titanium it is okay let me write it properly for titanium it is Okay, what is that? Titanium alkoxide, Ti, O, C4, H9, 4, that is titanium alkoxide. What is, again let me tell you, alko, 
this is actually this is a precursor of titanium correct so now the precursor is subjected to polymerization reaction you can add some polymerizing uh, pieces into it and make it polymerize so once in polymerize you will form a long chain molecule correct so once it is polymerize then basically it will form a colloidal suspension obviously if a polymerizing it will lead to long chain molecule production that will lead to colloids and this is what is known as a sol you can see that correct so this precursor is then mixed with a polymerization agent and hydrolyzed and polymerized so that a sol forms then what happen you keep this sol for some time at some elevated temperature this will lead to precipitation of these nanoparticles like titanium nanoparticles from this alkoxides will be precipitates okay and then once they are precipitated then you can actually in order to so they are precipitated and then they will now grow they will come and join together and grow in order to stop this growth of these precipitates what you can do you can produce a gel you can add a jellyfy gelling agents okay there are many gelling agents are available okay this is basically nothing but a surfactant correct so these surfactants will lead to uh, you know three dimensional network of gel and three dimensional network of gels will have a you know you can see that actually they have a very nice uh, structure and these structures will allow nanoparticles to be embedded inside this gel so that they cannot come in contact with each other and cannot grow correct that is the idea so sol is produced uh, first is made to get the nanoparticles formed but then once the nanoparticle forms they can come in contact with each other and grow you have to stop that you have to form a gel so after you have discrete nanoparticle formation then only the jelly gelling agent has to be added okay don't ask me what the gelling agent so okay, you can ask your mother who is knows how to make gel uh, the jams they will tell you easily what they add to make this gelling agent so this is an exercise for you to learn from your uh, you know kitchen because you are at home and you can always ask your mother or your maybe if your father is also knows okay or like me then you can ask how they make the jams so jams that will tell you how what is the gel how gel can be formed okay so idea is to form a open 3d network okay and that network will allow basically uh, the nanoporous basically to form some nanoporous thin films and in that nanoparticles can get an embedded then once you heat it up this this membrane will be gone and you can collect the nanoparticles very easily so you can understand that this is a very very classic process and very interesting process to produce zero dimension nanoparticles well this also allow us that we can always do molecular self assembly what is molecular self assembly this is nothing but a self organization of organic uh, molecules okay what is that okay you know as you know what is self organization start with the liquid liquid atoms are random right because of thermal energy atoms will will like to be moving here and there so once you cool it down and crystallize the liquid atoms will come in together and form a crystallized network crystallization means what atoms will be forming a regular interval in the crystal lattice that's nothing but self assembly atoms are getting self assembled in a fixed positions in the lattice so that exactly same thing and nature uses extensively for that crystallization is a natural process it can happen in volcanic rocks it can happen in even water when mixed with salt or something so nature uses everything in fact perhaps, perhaps the most remarkable one is the self assembly of dna right and you know once a cell divides every cell has a life span before it dies it has to divide so once it divides the dna carries the information from the uh, you know parent cell to the product cell and that's actually had happens by again by what self assembly so uh, and basically this recently this this thing has come into big way and people are trying to realize how to exploit the potential of this technique okay idea is to create actually conditions in which molecules or atoms will self organize into useful structures again this is driven by minimization of the energy minimization of the free energy plus surface energy right so advantage is that the when the system 
is converged to very specific configuration without need of further control because it is self assembling. So, energy has to minimize. So, you do not need to control it, it will, it will be self control itself. Typically, aggregate forms by self assembly and they tend to bond each other very weak energy. Normally, this will be not larger than thermal energy as KT. Okay? And these molecules actually self assembly molecules are called as a micelles. Okay? You can see that these are all called micelles. And every micelles will have two parts, hydrophobic part and hydrophilic part. Hydrophobic part means they do not like water, that is why it is called phobic, phobia, okay. claustrophobia. If uh, inside the lift you feel claustrophobic, same thing. Hydrophobic means they do not like water, that is why they will be away from water. And hydrophilic heads, they will be, they will like water. So, they will be self assembling, they will come together and form such a kind of a cavity. You can see that. With inside there is water, correct. Now, you can have a reaction in this in the water media or maybe in some other media. Sometimes you can form such kind of micelle structures using uh, polymer as, as organic media also like some alcohol or some kind of other compounds, liquid, organic molecules is also possible. But finally, it is basically a cavity forming by this hydrophilic heads of the micelles. So then center of the micelles can act as a reaction chamber in which you can have react, uh, reaction possible and that can lead to production of nanoparticles, right. And you know that to give you perspectives of that, you can also have self assembly of 2D nanofilms, right. And that is what is done by Langmore. Those of you know Langmore blood jet. technique, right. What is that done in this case? Well, a monolayer of fatty acid is formed on the surface of water. If you put a fatty acid, this will spread uniformly on the surface of water, it's basically because of Van der Waals interactions. And then uh, you can simply, uh, because it has a hydrophilic part and hydrophobic part. So, all the hydrophilic part will be touching the water surface, hydrophobic parts will be away from the water surface. Okay. So, the fatty acid self assembled across the water surface as a monolayer, correct. And uh, any other assignment is not allowed. Then you can put a substrate, substrate is nothing but a uh, surface on which this can be formed into the water, deep into the water and then take it out. So, then you can form a nice two dimensional thin films on the surface of that. The thickness of the thin films will be very small, that is that is what is called a 2 D thin films, 2 I 2 D because two dimensions are in a micron scale and thickness is in the nanometric scale. So, this is very easily done. There are many such uh, kind of systems available in the world where you can actually produce such a kind of a nice structures, okay? self assembled structures. So, that is all for all the 0 dimension nanoparticles. Now, we are going to talk about two and three dimension or two and one dimension nanoparticles. Okay. So, two let me write down this is 1 D or 2 D okay. nanoparticles. Okay. So, that means how to create that right. Well, one of the way of to creating this is to what is known as a electro deposition you know it is a standard technique in which you can create large area thin flame. Okay. And these thin films will have thickness of nanometric scale and x, y, z dimensions can be very large you can, because you are putting a substrate. By the way, what is electro deposition? Electro deposition is nothing but if you have a, if you have a cell, electrolytic cell in which you have a solution, this is a solution inside it you can see and you have two electrodes, one anode, one cathode. Okay. Then if you apply current through this circuit, what will happen? Things will dissolve from anode and then get deposited on the cathode. That is what happens. Now, how to create nanocrystalline deposits? Well, that can be done by putting a various way by putting a pulse current okay, or pulse voltage basically. Because we are applying a voltage, instead of applying a constant voltage you can have pulsing. And this uh, you know pulsing can be on and off. You can see this is off cycle, voltage is off, this is on cycle. right? And the thickness of this width for the on cycle would be nanoseconds. 
like 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Off cycle can be large, okay, it can be as large even microsecond also. So, when you are making the cycle on, that means when the voltage is on, okay, crystallization happens. That means the material get dissolved from the anode and then they reduced and get deposited on the cathode, correct. So, then the off cycle nothing happens because you are not applying voltage. So, what will happen? Nothing will happen. So, idea is to nucleate these grains of the material from the anode whatever dissolving and do not allow them to grow. So, if you put a constant voltage nucleation will happen one step then final growth will happen extensively and you will not be able to retain the anode crystalline grains. So, in order to do that you need to do a pulsing operation okay? and this pulsing is very very uh, important you know uh, you can have on and off pulses to create that. Otherwise you can have you can combine this thing with high current density if you make a high current density current density is what current per unit area of the cathode. So, if you apply a high current density okay, then what will happen nucleation rate will be high that means at a particular time many many nuclei will form and these nuclei will can cover the whole surface and they will come in contact with each other. So, they cannot grow any further I, they can only grow when they center but temperature is not very large in this kind of electro depositions. So, it will happen normally at room temperature. So, therefore, you can always create nanostructure 2 D thin films very easily. So, you know this is a classic process and this has been widely used uh, many many in fact long time I can say and pulsing actually requires a device to do that you know all the uh, potential stats available can do pulsing operations that is easily done. Okay. So, that is one of the way of creating thin flames right very easily one can do. Then you can do obviously PVD and CBD, PVD is what physical vapor deposition. Physical vapor deposition you know there are many such techniques I am not going to discuss uh, details about that. Well the easiest one technique is to create a vacuum chamber and in which you can put a things which you want to deposit right like a metal or a polymer or a ceramic and then heat it up you can keep it put it in a boat you can see that this is put it in a boat right and then what do you do then you basically heat it up once you heat it up this will evaporate inside this vacuum chamber. So, once it evaporates it will create vapor then if you put a substrate little further away from it you can see that these vapors will deposit in the substrate and create a thin plane this is the simplest one. But you may not need to deheat always because some metals may not be operating at all at normal temperatures or maybe they will take you high temperatures. So, you can do a sputtering okay, using argon ion or you can do even magnetic magnetic sputtering there are many ways of doing that. Okay. So, this PVD allows you to create again 2D nanomaterials okay, by proper control of the whole process. Your gain size of this thin film can be very small nanometric domain and thin film can also be nanometric thickness both are possible. Well, you know many everything cannot be deposited by PVD. So, that is why CVD use what is known as a chemical vapor deposition. Okay. Uh, chemical vapor deposition is a route in which a reactant gas mixture in come in contact with the surface on which it has to be coated correct and then on coming in contact with that substrate or surface on which it is to be coated the reaction happens basically gas decomposes like a methane if you put it on a subst uh, heat it up and put it on a surface like nickel or something it will decompose into carbon and water in presence of it, oxygen and this carbon then can deposit as a thin film of uh, graphene uh, whatever nanotubes or even pure amorphous carbon also all kinds of things can be prepared and you know uh, so deposit can be formed by reactions between the precursor gas in the vapor page or by reaction between a vapor and the surface of the substrate. So, you can also have a reaction in the gas phase also like you can put two gases they will react each other and produce the things which can be deposited on the substrate. So, there are many ways of doing that easiest one is to have put a gas inside the chamber and then allow the gas to come in contact with a surface at high temperature and the gas will decompose and produce a thin film other way of doing is that you can have a reaction between two gases or three gases in the gas phase and reaction will lead to the production of a deposit on a substrate. 
So both are possible. One of the variation of this is called you know uh, uh, moderate CBD that is called empty CBD or we, you know best one is called as a metal organic precursor CBD or MOCBD. Okay. As the decompose at relatively low temperature, because decompose temperature can be high also, then it is very difficult to maintain. So, but so you need to have a um, precursor which can decompose very easily at low temperature. That's what is a metal organic precursors can do. At the decompose at relatively low temperature, uh, reaction temperature is typically around 600 to 700, or even some cases 500. The chemical reaction in the vapor phase are activated by creation of plasma. Also, you can have a plasma CVD. Okay. If you create, a, if you put a plasma on the surface of that, it can lead to uh, rapid reactions, okay, or decomposition possible. And that is also PVCVD, plasma enhanced PCVD, okay. PCVD is plasma enhanced CVD, or MOCVD, metal organic compound CVD. Both are basically mean to reduce the decomposition temperature. Or you can also have, uh, you know, laser induced CVD also, LCVD possible. You can put a laser beam to decompose some gas. Basically, the idea is to decompose some gas to produce some deposit on the substrate. That is the idea in CVD. In CVD, in PVD, you are evaporating something or sputtering something that will lead to generation of the molecules of vapor and this can deposit on the substrate. Okay, so, there are many variations of that. You know, you can read it thoroughly in different books also possible. So, what did I discuss? I discussed that you can create electro depositions, you can create two dynamics by electro deposition or PVD or CVD. You can also do it by uh, you know a technique known as a thin film formation by sol gel. Okay, sol gel can also allow you to form thin films. Fine. So now let's come to the 3D, okay. I'll just discuss few of them and so that you understand it. Uh, you know uh, making 3D bar bulk nanomaterials is not easy. That means it will have a large grains with gain boundaries. That's what is bulk actually, and you know but these are important from the perspectives of applications because you can produce, you can induce huge strength, or you can induce many other properties. Like you can create high strength low alloy steels, you can create aluminium alloys, you can create magnesium alloys, titanium alloys, right? Many many such kind of things are possible. Correct? That's possible. Even aluminium alloys, you can. I've so told you that you can have precipitates. So basically, these are used for structural applications. Unlike all the others, thin films and nanoparticles, mostly they are used for functional applications. But these are used for structural applications. And the grain size should be between normally 10 to 100, if not 1 to 100. Okay, and they are basically made by top-down approach, which we have discussed already. Top-down approach means starting the big one and then do that. But you know, need not always. Uh, you know, start with the big one, big gun size. You can start with liquid also. So uh, materials, okay, would be rather crystals than glasses. You know, this is what is as we said, and many other people have said. Why? Because it orders all atoms will sit exactly the same distance from each other, and they can satisfy the interatomic bonds very easily. This order you will disturb this comfortable sitting atoms. You can see that when you are in a class. If you all are sitting in all the, you know, uh, every chair, that means the distance from each other is constant and your bonding is strong. But if you are sitting haphazardly, disorderly, some people here, some people there, then what will happen? There will be stretching of bonds and uh, there may be squeezing of others also if you are sitting very close by. And this leads to, uh, you know, energy of the system to be increased. Liquids are always disordered because the heat actually. Uh, leads to violent movement of the atoms, and they can sprung these low energy crystalline bonds very easily. But solids are not that; they are formed at lower temperatures. Therefore, this can do that. But you know, if you cool it rapidly, you can produce nanocrystals, right? How? Because if you cool it rapidly, the crystals will not get time to grow. And if you cool it rapidly, you can have large nucleation also. As the nucleation rate increases. You are going to form many, many, many nuclei and then they freeze rapidly, then you can have a small grain size. And that is what is done in a melt spinning technique. Okay. What is done in melt spinning technique? Okay, very simple. You can take a reservoir of a liquid or a molten alloy or a liquid, molten pure metal is also possible in this. This is a reservoir. Okay. And then you can allow this liquid to fall onto a 
water cooled spinning copper drum. Okay, I'll talk about why copper drum. As it's falling on this water cooled spinning, spinning at a very high speed, 2000 to 3000 RPM rotations per revolution per minute. Okay, because it's rotating high speed, it is water cooled. This thin liquid jet or stream actually, which is falling on this copper drum, immediately solidifies in a microsecond time, not even a millisecond, microsecond time. Because it is cooling at a very rapid rate, most likely it will lead to formation of amorphous phase. Or if you can control this cooling rate a little bit by controlling the spinning revolution per minute, or you can control the uh, cooling of this copper drum, then you can form nano crystal instead of amorphous. Okay. So, this is the way you can basically form a thin ribbons. This is actually ribbons, actually, you can see ribbons in which nano crystals are present. This is known as a melt spinning. You are spinning the ribbons out of the of the melting. Okay, so now why we are using copper? Because copper can extract heat very fast. It has a high thermal conductivity. So as soon as the liquid jet falls on this copper wheel, it can extract very fast. And if you cool it by water, it can even cool it, it can even remove very fast. So that's why in all this rapid solidification experiments, copper is used as a mold or as a drum or something like that. Okay. Okay, this is one way of creating nanostructure materials. Basically, you are forming thin strips by rapidly solidifying it. Other way of doing is to basically, uh, you know, using a surface molten layer. You can put a laser beam on the surface of this material. You can see that, correct? And as you put the laser beam and pass the laser beam is passed on the surface of this solid, a thin layer is molten. And now you imagine a thin liquid layer is in contact with a large solid layer. Heat transport will be massive, very fast from the liquid to the solid. Because of the very rapid heat transport from the liquid to the solid, the solid liquid on the surface of these, uh, because of laser melting, will solidify at a very fast rate. Okay, so you can see that you can solid, so you can cool it very fast by using melt spinning, using copper drum. You can also cool it very fast by first melting a thin layer on the surface of the uh, material by using a laser beam, or you can do electron beam also. So, only difference electron beam and laser beam is that electron beam requires a vacuum system, laser beam requires nothing, it can be done in normal air. Okay. Obviously, if you do a normal air, oxidation is high, so you, could, you have to put some argon gas or something near the molten zone. Okay. That is okay, this all can be done. So, that means what? You can always create nanostructure surface layers by using laser surface treatments. This is routinely done nowadays in various applications. If you want to create a surface layer which is nano structures, this can be easily uh, used as a technique. Correct. Well, well, yes, this is something I should discuss. I thought I should have discussed, but you know, you can always do a use a technique, what is known as a, the beating the foil, beating the gold leaf. All of you know that? Gilding. Gilding you do not know? Well. You have seen probably many people use this gilding as an art. It is nothing but applying gold leaf, thin layer of gold on a surface. Suppose you have a ring made up of stainless steel and you want to make it looking yellow color. Okay? So, you can put a gold leaf on this ring or even on the bracelet. Okay? Many people do it. Then it will be cheaper because it is not fully made of gold. Okay, the bracelet is very heavy. If you make fully made of gold, then it will be very expensive, right? Instead, you can you can put a layer of gold. But you know, in our olden days, there was no way of depositing gold by electro deposition. The technique was not known. So what the artisans used to do? They used to take a gold and hammer it, hammer hard and hard and hard. And as they hammer it, gold will become thinner and thinner, and it will form a lip. Okay. Remember that this word L E F. Leaf means very thin, as thin as like a tea leaves. Okay, so you can make that. Then this one can be wrapped around your objects, whatever you want to cover it up. And this is known as a gold uh, gilding. It is very old technique. It was available in, you know, Mesopotamian times also. Okay, many people know it. But this is a labor intensive method, much labor intensive. You can create 2D 
layers by this way. Instead of depositing thin films, you can easily do a 2D layer. But if you nowadays, obviously it is expensive, that's why people wanted to make as thin as possible. But if you make a very thin, it will may break. Or it may not have sufficient strength to withstand during wear and tear because you are wearing a bracelet and you are hitting it on surface, surface, it will break. So that's why you need, it will be always windy actually. Oh, not even windy, it will be 3D. Only the grains of gold will be nanocrystalline. Okay, by because of this heavy deformation, you are hitting hard and hard and hard. Because of heavy deformation, this will happen. Correct. So that is something which is always hap happen that. So one of the technique which is the uh, which is done, which can used to create some nano, nano nanostructure grains, is known as a ECA, or it is same as like lipid gold lips or E cap. What is that technique? E ECA or E cap? Okay, this is nothing but equiangle extrusion. E cap means equal channel angular processing. So you can see that how the E cap comes. Or what is ECA? Again, equal channel. angular extrusion because extrusion is a word which is peculiar to metallurgy that is why people use P angular processing. What is done here? Okay, Very simple thing. You can have a die, you can see this die, this is the die, correct. Oh, sorry, this is the plunger, this, this is not die. dies inside this is the die correct and this is written okay now you can this die is made such way that angle between entry and exit is higher than 90 degrees you can do 90 degrees also but it should be at least 90 degrees higher is better okay so now you put a material you can always heat it up Many cases you may not need to heat, but some material you need to heat it up. And then after it is hot, you can use a plunger uh, to push it down or push it down to pass through this channel, pass through this die. Because it is a channel and that is why it is not equal channel. You see that thickness of this channel is same. That is why it is called equal channel. And it is an angle, the entry and exit, that is why it is called angular. And because you are pushing is down, that is why it is known as extrusion. Okay. Those of you who know extrusion will understand that extrusion is a process in which you can push a metal through a die. Normally, when you are pushing is to the die, the entry and the exit dimensions are different. Normally, entry thickness will be larger, exit thickness will be lower. But here, it is opposite. Your entry and exit thickness are same. The diameter of this die, they are same. So, because of that, because you are pushing it high, so what will happen at this uh, position where there is a direction change okay here and this on this plane basically grains have to really reorient themselves so when they are reorienting themselves they elongated okay it was nicely hexagonal grains become elongated and in the whole process because you are pushing it hard the grains also get deformed and deformed extensively Deformation means it creates a lot of dislocation and twin structures. And then this can lead to nanocrystallization. Okay. That is what is done. How it is done? Well, suppose you have a large grain in this material. Now I deformed it. Once I deform, I will create defects like dislocation inside the grain. You can create twins also. So as you create more and more dislocations, they will triangle, they will interact each other, correct. Because they are entangled, randomly forming, energy of the system will increase. So what they will like to do? They will like to arrange themselves nicely. So that is why what they can do is, they can arrange nicely inside these grains.
easily they can arrange inside these grains. How? They can form small angle gain models like these they can arrange. So, what you are doing? You are forming additional gain boundaries. And when they do that, the dislocations can easily reduce their energy. And that is the way they can form new grains. So, these big grains then become disintegrated to small grains. Okay. So, you can start with big grain and then you can divide these grains into small grains because of defect generation. Dislocation is a defect right in solid material. So, these defects will lead to reorganization of the defects because as you create more and more defects that is what happens if you are hitting a gold leaf hitting 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 you will generate keep on generating dislocations right. But then once it will be filled with dislocation density will be so high that dislocations will be interacting each other they will cut each other energy of the whole thing will increase mechanical energy and to reduce it this dislocation will like to rearrange themselves. One of the way of rearranging themselves is what? One of the way rearranging themselves is by forming the small angle gain boundaries because any small angle gain boundary will be nothing but a combination of dislocations arranged nicely one after the another one below the other correct. That is why they can do such a kind of a nice uh, crystallization, crystallized grains or recrystallized grains whatever you say or recovered grains it can form. So, this is what happens in this case also not only the grains are getting elongated, but also grains are becoming finer because of these aspects. So, just now I discussed correct defect generation defect generation here and defect reorganization here correct these are the two ways things happen. So, I will stop here I think I have discussed a lot. Okay, so, what I discussed I started with zero dimension nanomaterials remember in the last lecture I have discussed about the inert gas condensations and in this case I have discussed about uh, sonochemical techniques, sol gel techniques right and then I discussed about what else sonochemical sol gen let me go back molecular assembly self assembly like Langmuir Borget techniques. Then I discussed about 2D or 1D nanomaterials like electro repositions, PVD, CVD okay. and obviously then I started discussing about the three dimensional nanomaterials like liquid root mill spinning or laser surface treatments or deformation roots. So, we will continue discussing about these things in the next lecture also. I will try to complete in the next lecture that whole process of synthesis of nanomaterials. Then I will move forward for the properties. Thank you.